Thank you for joining us for this information session. Tonight, we will be discussing the online and part-time graduate programs in space systems engineering offered through the Whiting School of Engineering at Johns Hopkins University. My name is Cheryl Williams, and I am the Recruitment and Marketing Specialist for the Whiting School of Engineering. With me tonight is Dr. Clint Edwards. Clint is the program coordinator for our space systems engineering programs. He has a, had a long history with Johns Hopkins University that includes serving as a member of the senior professional staff at our Applied Physics Laboratory, where he worked as the assistant program manager for Naval Remote Sensing Algorithm Development. He served as the vice chair for our online and part-time graduate programs in electrical and computer engineering and is formally the chair of our Space Systems Engineering graduate programs. Clint recently stepped down from his chair responsibilities to pursue a new position as branch head of military sensor systems for the Space Dynamics Laboratory. We are so thrilled that throughout this transition, Clint has remained an active member of our faculty and the Space Systems Engineering program leadership. He teaches a number of courses for our programs, including signals and systems, digital signal processing, and principles of optics. Clint, would you like to say hello? Hey, uh, welcome everyone. It's always a real joy to get to spend some time with you this evening. Thank you, Clint. For tonight's presentation, we'll start off with an introduction to Johns Hopkins Engineering. Next, Clint will discuss with you our master's program in space systems engineering. Then we'll review some helpful information on tuition and payment options, talk about next steps and important dates. So why study engineering at Johns Hopkins University? Johns Hopkins University was founded in 1876 as the nation's first research university. The School of Engineering opened its doors in 1913. And in 1915, it began offering part-time engineering coursework as night classes for technical workers. Since then, we've grown to offer more than 20 master's programs that can be completed part-time. 16 of these programs can be completed entirely online. We, our programs are designed by people who thoroughly understand your industry. We like to say that our programs are for engineers, by engineers. Our faculty are all expert and working engineers. And our faculty and instructional designers construct new and update existing coursework every year so that it includes the most up-to-date information. In addition to our part-time programs, the Whiting School of Engineering has over 25 research centers and institutes. This includes our strong partnership with the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory in Laurel, Maryland. We also offer full-time bachelor's, master's, and PhD programs that are in residence at our Homewood campus in Baltimore, Maryland. Our online and part-time programs are led by respected senior engineers from our Applied Physics Laboratory and faculty from our full-time programs. We are ranked in the top 25 best online graduate engineering programs by US News and World Report. And of all the schools that are included in these rankings, we actually have the largest online part-time student population. So not only will you have lots of fellow students going through a similar learning experience, but these rankings really speak to the quality of our programs regardless of our size, and our school is experienced and well-equipped to help you navigate graduate education as an online student. The degree that you earn studying with us part-time is of the same quality as our full-time degree programs. Your diploma will not say online or part-time. You are eligible and highly encouraged to participate in commencement. And as a graduate, you will be one of more than 28,000 Whiting School alumni and will join our esteemed international alumni community. So that is an overview of who we are and the value of our programs. Now Clint is going to talk to you more about space systems engineering. Clint? Hey, so uh, space systems engineering is uh, an area that has really been developed in the last five years. Uh, Space has absolutely exploded in terms of the commercialization with uh, uh, companies like SpaceX and uh, Digital Globe and other uh, uh, companies that are interested in putting up uh, sometimes, you know, hundreds of satellites or providing reusable launch vehicles, uh, things like that have caused 
uh, the, the space industry to, to rapidly expand, as well as the accessibility to, to space, including small space using small satellites and CubeSats, uh, has just kind of blossomed in the last five years. Okay, so yeah, so we have a number of faculty that teach for us. This is just a selection here. Uh, but I, I guess I'd like to really kind of point out that these really are expert tr practitioners. I know uh, these individuals here, and many of them have contributed to uh, space flight missions, including like New Horizons, which was the Pluto flyby that happened a few years ago. That whole mission uh, was was launched and managed and executed by the Applied Physics Lab. And you know, so when you're in these classes talking about uh, you know, different design traits between size, weight, and power, you are talking to people who have done this, you know, and have, have done this uh, successfully uh, on large-scale missions like the, like the Pluto flyby. All right, I thought I saw that slide. Okay, so kind of how we did this. So when I was chair, we, we had two really strong people helping us on the, the graduate committee. One was Bruce Carlson, who was the former head of the National Reconnaissance Office. That's a military kind of a government military side of space and then we also had uh, Dr. Mike Griffin who was the former head of NASA now the deputy director for DOD in terms of research and engineering and they sat down with me and we went through kind of these focus areas that we had and we really recognized that there was a, a, sort of a fundamental need for two different kinds of space systems engineers there were those that really needed to be versed in systems engineering with applications in space. So these would be uh, engineers that were maybe moving towards a more senior point in their career. Uh, they probably weren't gonna be designing sensors and subsystems, but rather needed to understand the systems engineering construct and how that might apply uh, to space. And then they would be uh, brought along with several examples. Additionally though, we recognize that there are system the space systems engineers that are highly technical and they have been successful in their technical careers and they want to hold on to that they just want to be able to work in the space environment and so for those there we have kind of two different tracks we have the leadership and management track which i think of as uh, general carlson um, as uh, you know can kind of he developed that track and then dr mike griffin who developed the technical systems and subsystems track. And so we've um, gathered classes in these two uh, different um, focus areas. And then we also have a set of core classes there. So uh, like, like many master's degrees, this is the traditional 10 course master's degree. Each class will be three credits. So it comes up to a 30 credit uh, master's degree. You have up to five years to complete it from the time that you start that but uh, we also allow for there to be some flexibility events happen you know in your life whether it's the birth of a child or whatever that caused you to need to take a hiatus for you know a year 18 months and you know when those kinds of things happen you really just email your uh, your program chair and say hey you know I, I need to take a break for a little while and, and they can pause your five-year clock and if necessary they can even extend your clock to a six year but uh, we find that it is helpful if students uh, with, with some sort of regular cadence proceed through those 10 courses there. The first five courses are uh, core courses. These are fundamental courses that we believe every space systems engineer should have. It goes through the fundamentals of space systems engineering. It's going to teach you about the systems engineering construct, construct and then towards the end of your career, there is an applications of space systems engineering as well as a hands-on small sat lab where you get to have your hands on hardware and actually uh, experiment and test uh, devices that that act in our uh, small satellite components. So here we are listing kind of the core classes and we just did that and these classes are um, uh, these are going to be challenging classes for students that don't have a strong math background. Uh, that there has have been students that have gotten through here with only you know a semester of calculus, um, but oftentimes it's just the broad, you know, the, how broad the material is is going to be something that's challenging, and how you apply this to real kind of projects that you have have to have to participate in, um, and so your ability to think like an engineer is critically important. 
And so uh, that's kind of the first three classes right there. And then finally, what or actually what then happens between your th th first three classes and your second or your fourth and fifth class is you are able to customize your space systems engineering degree using the incredible variety of classes that are available through Johns Hopkins University. Johns Hopkins University has one of the, 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 the widest variety of classes I've ever seen. Uh, when I was the vice chair of electrical and computer engineering, we had over 85 classes that students could take, many of them with hands-on hardware type experience. And those sorts of classes, including uh, tech management classes, systems engineering classes, mechanical engineering, applied and computational math, applied physics, all these different programs are available for you to customize your space systems engineering degree. And so if you say, I'm gonna be a space systems engineer, but I'm really interested in uh, kind of communications engineering and you know link budgets and antennas, you know, you could go into, you know, applied physics and electrical engineering and customize your systems engineering degree or your space systems engineering degree to, to focus on that. Likewise, if you say, you know what, I'm actually going to be, you know, managing this really large effort. And what I need to understand is how to manage technical organizations uh, with that are working on space systems engineering. And for people like that, you know, they can take the tech management classes, they can take additional uh, systems engineering classes, and they're able to customize their space systems engineering uh, degree. But we fundamentally believe that all, uh, in, all space systems engineers coming out of Hopkins need to have these core classes. Uh, the applications of space systems engineering tends to be sort of a study in case, you know, kind of a case study of, um, of uh, different, you know, engineering events and sort of a, almost a seminar. Uh, additionally, the small satellite development and experimentation lab requires that you do come to campus that one weekend. So if you live in California, this will uh, require you to come to the the Hopkins campus for this for this class. But it's really powerful, and we have some pictures coming up. This is just a sampling of the kinds of electives that you could take. Additionally, your advisor is able to approve other classes that seem to make sense for your career goals. Uh, and so really, if you, you know, saw a class that wasn't on here, you would go to your, you would go to your advisor and talk to him or her and uh, get approval for that class. Uh, but you can see here that, that it's heavily, the technical systems and subsystems is heavily drawn out of applied physics, electrical engineering, mechanical engineering, and mathematics. Uh, including like a space weather and, and space systems class that, uh, yeah, space weather is actually an area that is uh, generating incredible interest right now just because of space events and the need to uh, make uh, smaller and smaller spacecraft able to operate in uh, harsh radiation-like environments uh, that are in space. And then for the leadership and management classes, we have uh, the directed studies in space systems engineering. So that's like essentially you would you would move through your, your set of classes and you would identify an instructor that you're like, you know what, I kind of feel like him and I, or her and I really connected. I, I want to kind of take that class to the next level. And so I'm gonna talk to that instructor and I'm gonna see if we can develop a topic. And then I'm gonna take, uh, you know, the paragraph or two that describes that topic with the instructor's uh, support. And I'm gonna present that to the space systems engineering chair. And with his or her approval, you can then, um, you can actually conduct, you can do this, you can do your own version of independent study with this instructor and that can take the place of, of uh, one class. Um, additionally, we have, you know, advanced systems engineering classes like systems architecting, system conceptual design and, and system design integration. So let's see what the next, so this is kind of a, a, a neat, neat picture of, the, of our class. Uh, working with the hardware. Here is a, a, uh, a, a, a small sat that has been uh, pinned out in a way that allows students to uh, evaluate the different components and subcomponents. This, uh, the, the young lady here to the left, she's using a uh, halogen uh, light there that's shining onto the six solar panels that are on the, the small sat. And how this would work is you would use this to orient your, your spacecraft with respect to the sun. So you can do two things with this. One is you can charge up your batteries uh, with these solar panels. Additionally, you can use the solar panels as a sensor. 
and you can determine how you can orient yourself with respect to the sun by determining what's the the actual energy or flux that's on each of the six panels there and so you can see if they start to move to the right that light's going to move off to the left and if they move off to the left then the light's going to move to the right and based on the changes in the voltages on those six panels you can kind of orient yourself so this is kind of cool also what they're doing right there is they have it floating um they're they're essentially using the momentum wheels that that are on this spacecraft and they're turning it and so what's really cool here is you get to have your you get to evaluate command and control this uh this experimental small sat and you're able to actually see how you know the commands go up and how the data comes down and all the different components and this is usually one of the last classes that um, a student in space systems engineering would take, but it is by far like one of the highest rated that we have. And I think it's because you're working with state of the art equipment. You're still, you know, getting your hands on it. You can experiment and uh, really get a feel for this hardware. And to me, when I look at this, it's like, this is why we produce engineers. You know, the people that come here identify with this sort of environment and you know they, they have questions that they want to answer and uh, we allow them to do this here at Hopkins. Okay so the admissions requirement um, that we require uh, a bachelor's degree in a technical discipline. Yeah there is occasionally a time when somebody does not have a technical degree but then we look for a significant technical experience especially in the area of, of space uh, that could allow them at least to become more familiar, or at least to have learned a lot of the things that they uh, that you would learn in a technical discipline. The grade point average requirement is uh, 3.0, and you know, quite frankly, if we have questions about your qualifications, you know, we really look at kind of your work experience or ask you why you know you'd like to do this. Oftentimes we have people coming from industry with 10 or 15 years of experience, and it's sort of hard uh, for uh, you know, a wonderful engineer, she's been working for 15 years, and we're going to go back to when she was 19 and look at how she did in calculus, you know, so we recognize that there's a, that you have been progressing throughout your career, and so we don't want you to think that there's this hard standard that if you, you know, if you don't meet it, that, that there isn't, uh, you know, there isn't opportunities for you here. Essentially, what I'd recommend is, you know, you would reach out to either myself or uh, Dr. Patrick Benning, who's the new uh, Space Systems Engineering Chair, and uh, you know, begin a discussion on sort of what the the path forward might look like for you. You know, worst case, if if the you know if the grades are you know pretty low, then more likely we would just suggest that you take some refresher classes just so that you come into the program uh, ready to succeed. Oh, and we don't require the GRE. Uh, in my opinion, the GRE is becoming less and less of an influence for graduate studies, um, and uh, you know, like MIT stopped taking it. Uh, things like that so so there's a number of different ways that you can complete this program uh, online has exploded in the last 10 years uh, where uh, most academic programs if they offer online they've seen a majority of their students shift to that environment mainly because of how convenient it is uh, it also uh, allows for you to really take responsibility for your education and so even though you're learning things through uh, interactive lectures or through discussion forms you have the access of the internet and the ability to search to find different information and topics and you're able to bring that into the the virtual classroom and uh, you and your fellow students are able to comment and discuss on that and so that was certainly something that was just never uh, available to me when i was in graduate school and I'm, I'm excited for it because essentially it almost gives you a 24-hour access to like a uh, you know a, a a discussion session you know that you might have only once a week uh, if you were in a face-to-face -face type class uh, and then eventually uh, also we have uh, virtual live virtual live is where you have an instructor uh, that you're able to watch uh, in real time but the class is also recorded and so you're able to view the recording and uh, you can you know some people take this virtual live and they essentially treat it like an online class where they're just viewing the lecture is completely asynchronous from the delivery but then there are other students that even you know go to the classroom and experience it and then they like the lecture recordings because they can back it up 
you know, and, and listen to a whole part again that they, you know, didn't didn't understand. And so I think that's another kind of great enhancement to to learning. So there's um, so what um, so we used to have several locations throughout the DC area, and we were primarily uh, an, a a regional uh, graduate program. But with online, what we've seen is that even students that live on the other side of Washington DC, rather than have to soldier through the traffic to get uh, to the applied physics lab or to uh, Baltimore, they would rather even just take either the virtual live or the online classes. And so our campuses have really uh, have really gone to concentrate both at the applied physics laboratory and at the uh, the Baltimore Homewood campus, which is where uh, when you think about the on, the when you think about the undergraduate university, that's Homewood. Uh, you know, the medical school is located uh, somewhere else, but uh, the applied physics laboratory is actually about halfway between uh, Washington, D.C. and Baltimore in uh, Laurel, Maryland. All right. All right. Thank you again, Clint. Uh, now we'd like to share some information to help you take this next step. Some of the most common questions our admissions team gets from prospective students is what is the tuition and what resources are available to help me pay? So here it is. Our tuition is currently $4,055 a course. As Clint said, our courses are three credits each. So this is the total tuition cost for each three credit course. Uh, because our tuition fluctuates every year due to inflation, we encourage students to budget $45,000 total for the cost of their degree. Uh, what is great um, is though this, this cost, you know, it may, May it, we, we say that it's excluding books and materials. It really depends upon what courses you enroll in. Um, books and materials are associated with the, the coursework that you enroll in. But in addition to the tuition, you're not paying any fees. So there's no technology fee that you'll have to pay on a semester basis. Our online and part-time students do not pay a student union fee. We actually do not uh, charge applicants a fee to submit their application. So we we have no application fee. The only fee that our their students pay uh, is a fee at the end of their studies with us uh, known as a graduate's fee. You have a variety of financing options available to you depending on your personal circumstance. I really encourage you to investigate and to take advantage of any education benefits that your employer may offer. I would say uh, the majority of our students do receive some uh, form of aid from their employer. So I really encourage you to reach out and investigate what options you have. Uh, if you are a US citizen or a qualifying U.S. resident, uh, you may be eligible to utilize financial aid. Uh, the financial aid that is available for graduate students is largely unsubsidized loans. So similar to that, you can, of course, finance your education through a personal loan. And if you are active duty or retired military and you have veterans benefits, you can, of course, utilize these uh, to finance your education. We do have a number of active duty and, and retired military enrolled in our online and part-time programs. If you're planning on using veterans benefits, here are some things to keep in mind. The URL that you see here on your screen has some great information on what forms you need to complete and to submit in order to utilize veterans benefits at Johns Hopkins. That URL, ep.jhu.edu backslash veterans. For students using uh, Chapter 33 post 911 benefits, the Department of Veterans Affairs sets an annual cap for private schools. That cap is $21,970.46, and that's for an entire academic school year. So it includes fall, spring, and summer semesters, and then renews every fall. Five courses with us will come underneath that cap. Uh, the cost for five courses is $20,275. So that would be if you took two courses in the spring and the summer semester, or spring and the fall semester, and then one in the summer. That would be five courses. Uh, six courses, unfortunately, will exceed the cap. The cost for six courses is $24,330. Thankfully, Johns Hopkins is a yellow ribbon school. How yellow ribbon works at Johns Hopkins is that it's applied in the summer semester only. Uh, or once the tuition cap is exceeded. And if it is exceeded, qualifying students can receive $1,000 per year. It's awarded on a first-come, first-served basis. 
The last thing I want to mention, uh, in the recent news, the Forever GAI bill uh, was signed into law. This law expands on the veterans' benefits uh, offered through Chapter 33, post 9-11 GI Bill. For example, it removes the benefit expiration dates for those who are charged, discharged, or released from the military on or after January 1st of 2013. So if this is you, you now have an unlimited amount of time to utilize your veterans' education benefits. They do not expire. For more information on the Forever GI Bill, I encourage you to visit military.com and just search uh, Forever GI Bill. They have a lot of really great information on that site. If you are located outside of the U.S. and are interested in studying with us, here are some helpful tips to keep in mind. Uh, international students are welcome to study with us from their home country through our online programs. Whether you study with us online or on site, here are some additional admissions requirements that uh, will apply to you, international students. International students must first submit a international credit evaluation of any credit earned at non-U.S. institutions. We prefer students to go through WES uh, as the third-party credit evaluation service for that document. They also have to submit proof of English proficiency via, for example, qualifying scores on a TOEFL exam. On-site students, in order to maintain their F-1 visa status, students must enroll full-time, and here's the definition right here of what full-time enrollment entails, as well as provide proof of financial support to cover annual living and education expenses. Next steps and important dates. So if you're interested in beginning a, an academic program with us, your first step is to submit your application. You can do so by visiting the URL that you see on your screen, ep.jhu.edu backslash apply. Again, we do not charge an application fee. After submitting your application, you'll need to submit your academic transcripts and your professional resume. We have rolling admissions here at Hopkins for our online and part-time students. It typically takes uh, the academic department and admissions four to six weeks uh, total to review a student's complete application uh, and then issue that student a decision letter. Uh, so with that in mind, here are some important dates. Our spring registration is already open. It opened on October the 26th, and our spring semester begins on January the 29th. So if you're interested in studying with us in our spring semester, I encourage you to submit your application as soon as possible, ideally well before December the 15th, to make sure that we can review it in enough time that will allow you to enroll in classes. Well, Clint, thank you so much again for your time yeah, this you evening. Bet. Oh, thank you, Cheryl, for inviting me and for the students, for uh, potential students for uh, attending. Appreciate that. Absolutely. Thank you, everyone, for your time this evening. Please stay in touch, and we look forward to reviewing your applications.